Welcome to UBU University, the podcast that loves learning what makes us each unique. It is our hope that hearing our instructors' challenges, successes, and other influences will give each of us more courage and freedom to impact our world with our own unique gifts. Today's instructor is Dr. Arthur Rauner. For over 20 years, Dr. Rauner fearlessly led reconciliation retreats with the most traumatized genocide survivors in Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, Congo, and South Sudan. What an amazing mission. Before Africa, Dr. Rauner's Ministry of Compassion inspired and challenged suburbanites at Colonial Church of Edina. For 32 years, Dr. Rauner loved hundreds of parishioners through celebrations, sickness, and death. Dr. Rauner authored over 20 books, hosted a television show, and recorded daily messages of encouragement. Dr. Rauner was educated at Harvard University, the University of Edinburgh, Union Theological Seminary, and Luther Theological Seminary. We are so appreciative of Arthur educating and inspiring the UBU community with the truths that have sustained him throughout his life. Arthur Rauner, I am so excited to be with you today. Well, me too, with you. (laughs) I so appreciate all you've done to love our family and so many people's family throughout Edina, Minnesota, and the world. And we thought it would be fun today to talk to you about what makes you unique and what allows you to continue doing what you do. So, what do you think gives you permission or throughout your life has given you permission to fill the world with your gifts and graces? I don't think I've ever thought of it as being given permission to do or be me. I, I've looked back at the influences that I had. My father was very important. He, he always backed us up as kids. He was a minister. It was clear that he wanted me to be a minister, but his word was, don't ever do that unless you just can't help yourself. You couldn't help yourself. I couldn't help myself. He certainly gave us as children permission to go do what we could, and he created some opportunities. How did he do that? Well, one of the early things that I, I thought of was I became a Boy Scout at 12 and an Eagle Scout. At 14. Sounds familiar. And uh, the Order of the Arrow that same year. He incurred that. You know, he grew up as a, an only child of a single mom on the frontier. And uh, without telling his story, he, he uh, said, in all my years at Central High School, I was never asked to write a paper. I said, I, I want my children to, to uh, go to school where they learn to write and he, he was able to send us because he was a fast talker both my brother and me to uh, the Choate School in Connecticut and uh, to Shipley for my big sister and uh, Emma Willard for my little sister so you know he had kind of designs on the kind of background we would have and the abilities we'd have so the, these schools were important, too, and helpful to you? Yeah, they were. I mean, at the Choke School, uh, a graduate 12 years ahead of me was John Kennedy. Oh. Uh, Adlai Stevenson was a, various political people were educated there. But at one point, my just before my last year in prep school, he said, you know, the Brethren Service Committee is looking for seagoing cowboys. They, they want to send uh, animals to Europe to help restart uh, agriculture after the Second World War. Europe was devastated. And uh, well, I was game for that, but I went off with my duffel bag and down from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and on to Newport News, 
Virginia waited there in the USO for my ship to come in, uh, which was loaded with 375 bred mares, wild off the plains of Wyoming. So I got to be a cowboy. That's something I always dreamed of. So uh, was that adventure something that was really influential to you? Yes, it was very important. What about it was important? Well, it was getting out into the world, and uh, I saw the devastation of war. You know, all the temptations of life were there. And, uh, on the way back, uh, we didn't have a cargo, and 20 of us, who, who we were having a bull session on the fantail of the ship. And uh, we had one guy, the oiler of the ship, was uh, drunk for the whole week we were there, and, with a prostitute, missed the boat, and we could see him hire a little bum boat to roll him out and showed how fast we were going. But he came into this little circle and said, essentially, what's it all about, Alfie? You know, what what is life? And I, I thought, I know what it's all about. I'm a Christian, I'm a minister's son, but I'm chickened out. I, I failed to have an answer for him. Felt very badly, went up on the, on the bow for the rest of our journey and uh, did a lot of praying. And uh, I felt terribly about failing this guy. And out of that came up my call to the ministry. But that was an influence my father had had on me, you know, he was willing to have me take the chances of what would be there. It's so interesting, the call to ministry um, maybe was both from your father and then this stranger that well, had a question. Well, you know, I felt that the call, oddly enough, was uh, a call to serve the Lord, but to, to be a minister particularly to the poor. And uh, if people say, well, would you end up in Edina, Minnesota? Well, uh, that's a story in itself. So that experience and the fact that at age 12, there was a great athlete, a, a miler. It was named Gil Dodds. And he came to Portsmouth, New Hampshire and did a crusade. And uh, I went forward to give my heart to Jesus. And my brother was there with me, and he did everything he could to restrain me. He, he, I was 12, he was 11, he was six feet four then. I think he knew that our father would be embarrassed that his son had to come to Jesus, and he would grow up in a family where Jesus was the heart of our life. So my father wouldn't speak to me for a couple of days. But my mother, fortunately, was a Baptist by background. So she understood, and that was a very seminal experience for me, one of a number of high points in, in my life. What about the call was significant to you? You seem like a man of mission and, and outward seeking. And what is about that particular experience was important to you? Well, of course, going to Greece, taking care of animals, uh, was going out for sure and uh, doing something very different for the good of the world. It was a kind of answer to the, the war. You said that you had a calling to the poor. Where, where do you think that came from? I think from the sky, the oil on the ship, very much so. It was my first real experience with uh, those kinds of people. And I went on to college. Actually, a very formative experience was rowing on the crew. What about that was formative to you? Well, I was captain of the freshman crew. And it was my job to set the stroke for the others and cheer everybody on. I'm a little ashamed of some of the language at the time that I used, but then I became the stroke for the second university crew. It fit with a view of leadership that the Choke School promoted. And it wasn't as obvious, perhaps, at Harvard, although that was another of the same kind of, of education. 
you know, that was pouring your body into making a little thin racing shell go fast. And in the end, we beat quite a few people at the Eastern Sprint Championships for over several years. And I've been rowing for, for the rest of my life. Uh, I still go down the Eden Prairies row on a rowing machine. But, you know, it was okay to be a leader. I was game for that. I knew that was something my father uh, would be glad for if I, when I chose the you, ministry. You seem like your ministry has sort of an athletic vigor to it and an enthusiasm and an all-in. Do you feel that that's true? Yes. I'd make a confession. I, one of the books I've written and never published was called The Minister's Fat Book. What's that about? It was about being in shape. Oh. But I, I always secretly cherished the view, uh, as I could see in my sense of who Jesus was. You know, he walked for three years. Right. I mean, he was on the trail. He was on the move. All the time, on the move. The journey of life. Uh, I mean, I've known plenty of Rotund ministers. <laughs> it probably wasn't a nice book, but I felt it was very important that I be faithful and that I be in shape and that I physically could do the work. So you're kind of all in, feels like body, mind, and spirit? It does kind of feel like how, that. How, yes. how would you describe that for you? Well, I haven't thought it through as a great philosophy. I, I just felt that was important and it was something I privately cared about. And, and the other experiences come of when I was a, a, in the seminary in New York. I was a Sunday school teacher at a big Presbyterian church in town. And uh, another student and I decided we'd take our two classes of uh, boys for a swim church pool. And uh, I went over to the east side to pick up little Eddie Frank from his family. And uh, he was so excited. And we went back to the Manhattan side. And the kids all jumped in the water. I, I knew about safety and swimming pools and all that. But suddenly we couldn't find oh. little Eddie Frank. Mm -hmm. So there at the bottom of the pool was this little blue body. Oh, I'm sorry. And he died, and it was it was a terrible experience. And uh, in the course of that, one of my seminary friends said, "You know, Arthur, there's a great preacher coming to uh, New York to preach at the Brick Presbyterian Church. You ought to go hear him." And it was James Stewart of Scotland. Uh, chaplain to the Queen and professor at New College. And uh, I did go up to hear him at Brick Church, and then he came to Union Seminary on Good Friday, preached on the rending of the veil, the moment of Jesus' crucifixion. There was a rending of the veil of right. the temple from top to the bottom. What did that mean to you at that time? It was a, it was the saving of my life. I mean, he, it was a word of access, of hope, uh, because the veil was what excluded people from the sacred holy of holies. And uh, here was, that was the end of that. Uh, the way was open, and, uh, and it was the beginning of a healing time for me. And I, I told Molly, I just... I want to go where he is. So we went to Scotland. And oh. I was one of his students. I have a book of prayers that I did. And uh, James Stewart has done a, a beautiful preface to that book for me long years ago. You felt a sense of forgiveness or allowing you to be who you needed to be at that time? or He represented the Christian faith to me and what it is to be a Christian. He was a very humble man, kind of a short man. And he gathered his robes around him when he preached. And, and, you know, he had this lyrical Scottish voice 
It was just marvelous. And he, uh, he drew you in. Yeah, well, I, we, we went to hear him preach on many Sundays at Palmerston Place Church, which was in the interim period. And then I had him in the course of the Gospel of Mark uh, at the, the New College. He, he was a great model for, for my life. You've always spoke about love and compassion, and did that come from him or all of it? How, how would you? Well, all of it together, I'm mm -hmm. sure, certainly came from him. Uh, came from the Bible. I, I was never a, a particularly a theologian, but a much more a church historian. History was my college concentration, and, and that is very much tied to uh, the role of the church in America right now, and my sense of the importance of that. But I think you need to, we need to anchor ourselves in, in the visions of the past, to go all the way back to the book of Acts, and Jesus' word to his disciples. And in terms of your concerns right now, how would you say that is not happening now. It's not happening? Well, I think we have moved quite a long way down a path of secularism. My illustration of the difference is the question, of, is the church allowed to be present in, in the marketplace, in, in the city square, when in the first decade of my work in Colonial Church, Colonial was invited to be there. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, the superintendent of schools called Colonial Church. Would Arthur come and talk to us? And many times that they opened doors for the churches to come and uh, the youth ministers to come and have lunch with the kids. And, and then it's closed suddenly. As one the black minister said, uh, yeah, we closed the door to the Lord and uh, opened the back door to the devil. Pretty much what they did. If you look at what's happened in the school system and uh, the secular take on interpretation of most things of philosophy, and, and I, I think that's happening across the country. Whereas we used to have a relationship, and the church did have something to say to the community. We took action. We, Colonial, as a free church, had the, uh, the ability to try to meet community need. We went into the city, and we went on the marches, and there were a lot of ways in which we tried to be true to our calling as Christians and to look at the, the need of, of the community. It wasn't easy. There were lots of people who found that they had kind of escaped to a suburb that was safe for them and so on. And they didn't want to go into the city. They didn't want to go for sure not to Africa. And I can see the pattern of God's leading us into wider and wider circles over the years. We were talking about different influences in your life and talked about your father and your mother and this man on the boat and your Scottish teacher. What other influences do you feel like allowed you to do the work that you've done? We had a, a guy in the membership of the church who was a lawyer for the Billy Graham Association. He got me a... a an appointment to visit with Billy Graham for a half hour. But I, I uh, went to a, a Billy Graham crusade uh, in New York, which was, uh, it had a school of evangelism with it. Well, one of the things we did was we went to the crusade in the evening, and uh, four nights in a row I had a chance to watch what the Spirit did to, to people. I mean, there were thousands there, but there were many hundreds of people. You can almost feel the, the, the silence and the waiting and people 
deciding will I go forward and then they go and I just feel that is a whole important part of the Christian life and experience the, the calling the, the spirit I learned early on and for our first little church in Western Massachusetts that uh, you never know what's being brought into church on a Sunday morning. You know, I had a chance to be a pastor to the whole community because we were the only church in town. And uh, I knew what was going on in the lives of a number of people. But I saw the church as having an opportunity to address the needs of people so we, you know, we had Bible studies and that sort of thing, but more and more, particularly at Colonial Church, we said, well, we're going to have an altar call on Ash Wednesday. And I remember one woman telling me about her experience. She's an old Minneapolis family, rather distinguished person, and she said she just struggled with, with the spirit. And finally, she stood up. She said, and on my cement feet, I walked forward and knelt at the steps and gave my heart to Jesus. And my life has never been the same since. And then, of course, another very important experience for me in 1972 was, was uh, the baptism in the Spirit, which happened at the hands of a Lutheran minister who was one of several uh, scholars who were at St. John's University, you know, and I, I was seeking the Spirit and trying to find what, what is it that happened. I could see the change in Colonial Church becoming a company of love, and I suppose I wanted to see what was happening out across the land. So I traveled all across the country and then in Europe, uh, and peculiarly, I was led to take steps in my own life that many people who were very near and dear to me, even in my family, did not approve of. What were those steps? They were steps like accepting the fact that there is a decision to be made of accepting Jesus. It doesn't have to be the same way for everybody, but it's there as an opportunity. There are other steps. Jesus says a great deal about the Holy Spirit. He's the prophet of the Spirit. And he told his disciples to go into all the world, preach the gospel, heal the sick, but don't go until you have received power from on high. And that's part of the problem of the church today, is trying to do church without the power. And uh, that concerns me very much. The words you used reminded me of the third step in Al-Anon or the third step in AA to turn our lives oh. and our will over to the care of God as we understood him. How would you paint a picture of the care of God and, and what events would you base that on? I would say to anybody, if you want permission to be your true self, cling to Christ. Hang on to Jesus. It's very simple. He knows and loves you. He has a plan for you. I'm, I take all that very seriously. What does that look like in your life? Well, I lost my job over it. The last big issue at Colonial Church was the issue of the Holy Spirit. And a decade earlier, I was sent by the church council to a psychiatrist who actually wrote a wonderful letter of recommendation for me, saying I was a nice, normal fellow. But anyway. How, how, how come they sent you to the psychologist? Because they thought I was crazy. I was off. What, what, what was off? Oh, I was leading the church into speaking in tongues, healing, all kinds of things. When you're going to take seriously the work of the Holy Spirit, 
Uh, you're a goofball. Did you kind of lose um, yourself in any way when your church is sending you to a psychologist, or or did you have to regain belief at all, or did you no. maintain the belief? No, I, I I couldn't. I mean, that was what I had was my faith in in God. And these were my friends. I mean, they were very good friends. One of the, the primary architect of my demise with her family came to our home for Thanksgiving for a number of years. And I went to see her after this was all over. And she said, well, it was a decision on my part whether to, uh, for the good of the church, to, you know, have you gone or uh, stand with you? And I chose the church. They were saving the church from me. How did you get beyond that betrayal, Arthur? But like, like most other grief, we left Colonial Church and World Vision was right there saying, you know, we won. The genocide has happened in Rwanda at precisely the same moment, ironically, that I was being like let, let out in 1994 in the spring. They said, we, we want to do reconciliation. We want you to go into Rwanda and see if you see any signs of that possibility. And, and they sent me in with one of their country directors. Uh, ultimately, out of that, several people lost their jobs at that time. There were 30 couples who wrote the church council saying, uh, we're going to withhold our pledge uh, until you got rid of Arthur. It would equal $300,000. So I said, okay, I'll go, but uh, you're going to wait for me to get to be 65, so I have some income. Going on the World Vision, that sort of helped with your grief and your loss and the, the betrayal you were feeling? Yes, because World Vision had a very different view of me than the church did at that time. And it wasn't the church as a whole, it's a very small group of people. I have a place I sit every Sunday. It's kind of like a little reconciliation corner. And uh, often at the passing of the peace, Daniel said, if you have aught against anybody, go to them. I've had numbers of people come to me. Wow. And we asked when we were in, in Africa doing retreats, and I'm supposed to be a reconciler, but I have this hurt in my heart. And uh, I wrote to David Fisher and said, is there any way we could have, Molly and I could address the congregation and ask their forgiveness for our part in that painful time? Well, there were some people who didn't want that to happen, but it did happen a year later. And uh, we had a service and they had communion and anointed us with oil and gave us a chance to speak. It changed a lot of things. Was that helpful for you? Yes, yes it was. Uh, but I mean, I, I knew that I needed to do my job and I felt I could stay through that interim time. But we had a moderator who gathered, had, had a meeting of the staff with a question to them, do you, do you think Arthur can bide it out? Can, can he last? And they all said no. We don't think so. So it was a, a mixed time. And uh, When you feel that betrayal and hurt and, and just, quite frankly, meanness of people, how do you separate your understanding of God with the betrayal of people? What happened to Jesus? He was betrayed. The very people who cried out, welcome, King, Messiah, to your kingdom. They were crying, crucify him a week later. You know, in the course of things, you learn a lot about people. And uh, mercifully, uh, I'm able to laugh about it now. And I, I have been able, uh, in some unspoken ways, 
to make peace with a number of these people. It's the healing work that Jesus does, and I prayed for that and tried to be open to that and not turn against people. Uh, Were there examples of feeling God in your presence in those times? If, if you think about understanding the care of God, how were there examples of that that you felt or saw or heard for you? One thing was that my greatest supporter and helper in this was my wife, who had not had that experience, but in the course of things she remembered the time when she was three or four years old, sitting in a sunbeam, on the floor of the Purchase New York meeting house of the Quaker meeting. And she felt the spirit come upon her. She was very quiet about it, but she stood by me and the experience of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, gift of healing, gift of tongues, I don't know what other gifts that, that were given at that time, they said, don't let go of that. And uh, she uh, has stood by. Uh, I had a number of friends who went out of their way to stand by me. I, I knew I was not alone, but the way things go, you know, you, you don't have to have everybody. You just have a few people who can just change the atmosphere for a whole institution. But they'd let me come back, and now as a gift of my 90th birthday, they've named the meeting house after me. That's awesome. Not that I was waiting for that or had any idea that any such thing would happen. I, I've never lost a, the sense of Jesus' presence and his care for me. When we went to Rwanda, there was one very important experience with Molly. She stood stock still in a little balcony in a rundown hotel. We were there. And she was apparently at prayer, asking God why he had brought her there. He said, I have no skills, no, why am I here? And he said, I brought you here to ask their forgiveness for what you and your people in the West did to divide them from each other. And she took that seriously many times. She would pull a chair out and say, this is what God said to me to do. So we learned humility out of that. There's a lot of condescension in the work of white American missionaries across the world. The Americans think they know everything. It comes very naturally to them. They do know a lot of things. You know, one, one little retired minister of a little Methodist church outside of Bujumbura. Uh, guests were asked to greet the congregation. It was a small church. And, and that's when Molly did it again, her little thing. And afterwards he said, you know, we've never seen anything like this. Because with us always, even the missionaries who brought us the gospel, they were always up here. We were always down here. Not intended, but that's the way it works out. I remember having coffee at a hotel with a guy who was in the first retreat we did in Bujumbura. And he was kind of grumpy about the missionary. I said, well, that's Molly and me. He said, no, that's not you and Molly. What was different? Well, he said, typically when the white, white folks come, they have their black person who's they're going to give them a chance to teach or say something. They'll do a long introduction. Then they put their guy forward. Then they do a long postlude to make sure everything is okay. See, you never do that. Well, we might have done it, but we had Techly Selassie in charge of us. He just say, Arthur, you talk about this. The ball you do. Well, finally, we had to organize it a little bit. We learned that they were watching us how we dealt with each other, and uh, how we dealt with them. So it's very delicate, very deep things. What called you to start the reconciliation ministry? That's a good question. 
I've looked back and found that reconciliation was actually part of a lot of what I did as a minister over the years in three different churches. You know, we had 12 years working with World Vision to fight the famine in East Africa. It was a very exciting time. We made some wonderful friends, got into Ethiopia. But the genocide was so horrible. I mean, it was Christians against Christians. We just felt compelled by that. We wanted to find a way to do something to help. And it was Ward Brem who said to World Vision, well, look, if you want to do this, why don't you assign this to the Pilgrim Center? To, and that's what they decided to do. So they were our partners for five years. And then we were on our own after that. How did that work impact you and who you are? I hope it made me more humble. I joke about the fact that my wife is still trying to get me to be humble. What's the importance of being humble? Well, I think it's daring to, to repent of your sins, of the things that you've done wrong, of people you hurt, and acknowledging that you have hurt people, maybe unintentionally and being serious about that. And Molly was the brave one, and I followed her, I learned from her. And I think she gave a kind of mark, sort of an imprimatur for the work of the Pilgrim Center, a, a way of doing the things that we've learned from our experience that uh, you don't talk about, you just but you know that this is there. For one thing, you know that if you're there and you uh, come with the right heart and purpose, Jesus will always come. Always. We've had some terrible retreats and we discovered a year later that the Lord was there. And people said, oh, amazing things happened after that retreat two years ago or a year ago. You know, the call to Africa was itself was a very interesting thing. When I first went to Africa with World Vision, when I got back, I found the staff was all upset. And uh, the vice moderator, my friend, had gathered the staff together and said, uh, said what, do you, what do you think about Arthur going off to Africa? The theme was, he's not doing his job here, he's going off to Africa, whatever that means. They didn't know, but... But you were still called to go, despite the yes. um, pressure you, you felt otherwise. Why did you keep going, despite all the pressure? Well, that was just the beginning. Uh, we felt it was a call of God. We went as five churches together, and uh, World Vision came to present a proposal to Roger Anderson and to me at our churches. I said, people are dying in the Horn of Africa. Will you come over and help us? Now, just like a Macedonian call. I said, we want you to raise $250,000 to help World Vision do this work. And then when you were there, did you feel you just had to keep going? Yes. Africa has that effect on people. I tell the people this. Both the soil and the soul of Africa are, are very powerful in their influence on people who come wanting to, to what, help. What did it do to you? Well, it uh, kind of made me an African. What is that? Somebody in, like? in the elevator noticed my bracelets. He said, I grew up in Tanzania. Some of those looked like Tanzania. And I said, I think probably a couple of them are, but these are mostly from the Pocock people uh, and, and were gifts originally. We had a woman who said it was on a, an early team. But well, we knew that you cared when you sent money, but we knew you loved us when you came back. Actually, a World Vision, once they got people hooked on something and they kind of done the projects and given the money they wanted to go on to other projects. 
rather than and we stepped over the traces and refused to, to leave. So we had many years with the, the Pocop people in Little Kiwawa. You had the Ministry of Presence? Yes. They and counted it as that. And that's another part that I realized, you know, gradually learning that through the years in three different churches. That basically, it's just being there. It's just being, you come and stand by. When you said that you became an African, what does that feel like or look like for you? Well, for me, it was a breaking down of the barrier. It, we were taken into the, the heart of, the broken heart of Africa. I mean, Rwanda was the Hutus against the Tutsis. They're both Christians. And uh, there were awful things that okay. happened between them. And, um, but we learned I mean, one thing was we were already old in the interview. Well, we were 65, so. I read that that was very different for Africa. They love old people. They're the ones who have, have the stories to tell and the memory and so on. The Africans, you know, we had an early retreat in um, the same city in Rwanda where the penitentiary is. And I remember that we had a couple guys who came and they said after us, we, we, we thought, who are these people? They're here and they know everything. And said, uh, we came to mock, but we stayed to pray because they saw something that was different. And it's that difference that, uh, that led them to receive us as friends, but we were welcomed as friends. I, I got numbers of emails from young people who aren't so young anymore in Kiwawa, Kenya, for my birthday. Because you were there and present and loving them? And, well, I what, remember that, yeah. Do you have some stories of forgiveness or reconciliation in Africa that stand out? I mean, there's so many, but are there particular ones that you think would be important to talk about? Molly says she has a thousand stories. Uh, I know most of them too, but I, I, I'm not so good at calling them up. Well, I've had a couple of things. We had, at one point, there were people in jail as genocidaires who, who came out just begging to be forgiven, mm -hmm. and uh, and and they and they came came and became fast friends with these people to whom they had hurt. You know, the, the spirit was at work in all kinds of ways, and there were many people essentially doing reconciliation work. Uh, our our Paul Dahigwa, who's the head of our work in Rwanda came, has come several times uh, to visit. And he was he was here several years ago and spoke in the hearth room to 60, 70 people. And he described how he was grew up as a refugee and from an earlier genocide in Uganda, where the whole RPF army were refugees. And they came down, they ended the genocide. General Dallaire from Canada was in charge of the the UN troops who were in in Bujumbura, half an hour away, and uh, he appealed to first to Kofi Annan, said, "I know what's going on, and we can stop it before it begins." And the Kofi and the UN would not do anything. He went to Bill Clinton, same thing, and the genocide came. And he's written a book called "Shake Hands with the Devil." Uh, his whole experience. And he said, I, I came down into Rwanda just behind the uh, RPF army, and I, I wanted to do what I could to be sure that my people didn't take revenge. And I preached Jesus, and I was a good preacher too. And he said, 
But in my heart, I hated the Hutus. And uh, it took three retreats uh, to get us going, and finally it was healed mm -hmm. in that time. Well, the minute it was over, there was a woman sitting in the front row, a colonial woman. She leapt to her feet, flung her arms around me, whispered in my ear, Arthur, I've been angry with you for many years, and I'm sorry, and I ask you to forgive me. She saves me a seat every Sunday, oh. she and her husband. And one time, the Friday men's group, they had asked me to come and talk to them. It didn't go well. But now, years later, they said, oh, Arthur, please come and talk to us. So I finally decided I would. And I said, I'm going to take a leaf from my wife's notebook. Uh, I realize that I've, in the course of things, hurt some people. And I, I want to ask your forgiveness for me. Afterwards, several men came up to me saying, thank you for your asking for forgiveness. And then after that, the next Sunday, two or three guys came up to me and said, thanks for speaking to us. That was really great. You know, we appreciate what you did. And this woman who saves the seat for me, she said, you must stay here until this reconciliation work is done. So quietly, she had created a little reconciliation corner and going on still today. That's amazing. What do you think it is about us that we, we want that so much? I think it's because we instinctively believe in God and we know we're on the wrong side and that something has to be set right and forgiveness is the pathway for doing that. And my observation as a used to be young minister was that forgiveness is one of the hardest things for Christians to do. You'd think we'd be very good at it. Right. I mean, we have it written in our liturgies and all sorts of things, and, and we go, we say the words, but to really do it and uh, face the difference, face the hurt that's there. If you were to tell the UBU University audience a word of wisdom, some nugget of truth that they can continue to feel good about their uniqueness that they've been given and go out in the world, what wisdom would that be? Cling to Jesus. They wouldn't want to hear it particularly. Sure they would. Uh, but How do you do that, Arthur? How do you cling to Jesus? You pray. You turn to him. You try to follow in his trail. Think of yourself out on the journey that for me has been an image all my life, my life surely as a minister. But I would say it's, it's as simple as that because any uniqueness we have, the gifts we have, have been given us by the Lord. We're children of God. Whether we acknowledge it or not is another issue, but we were given life as each one would take a step to do that, God would show them if they're really open. He would show them. But he, he doesn't show us the whole pathway. Jesus didn't show the whole three years to the disciples, but just one step at a time. And that's the way he works with us. I so appreciate all you've done to love our family and baptize and marry and help with family. help with all the hurts and good times and bad times and you've done that for so many people. So thank you. It's been wonderful to hear from you. Appreciate it. Thank you for asking. 
This has been UBU University Podcast. For more information, visit our website at the letters UBU University.com. Thank you for listening.